Welcome to the first poll roundup. This is a bit of an experiment. Obviously, I've been doing these weekly polls and not reacting to them too much. Plus, I do have a bit of a gap in the usual schedule. We're a third of the way through Valleys of Death, so that's a natural break. And I'm currently knee deep in a huge Battle for Normandy game against top tier opposition, which is really monopolizing the chunk of my brain devoted to combat mission. Plus, of course, waiting in the wings, we have both Fire and Rubble and Cold War, hovering like some kind of Sword of Damocles, ready to fall on any major project I get stuck into. Obviously, if either of those do drop, I intend to be all over them. So, we're going to go over the first four polls in this video. Like I say, it's not the usual stuff, but some of the polls pose some interesting questions and have generated some interesting results. Plus, I don't actually get to vote in these, so I'll do it here. Poll number one was, what's your favourite tracked infantry fighting vehicle in combat mission Black Sea between the BMP-2, the BMP-2M, the BMP-3M, the Bradley and the MTLB M6MB? And of course the Bradley wins by a significant margin and if I got to vote I would vote Bradley too. In combat mission, at least, it can take on enemy armour with the tow, it can take on light vehicles and infantry with the 25mm Bushmaster, it has excellent optics, thermals and fire control, and all the while it's carrying an infantry squad that can loot its inside for a javelin, which is arguably the best ATGM in the game. It's certainly a bigger vehicle than the other choices, but probably also the most survivable. It's got default explosive reactive armor, it does have the option for APS, and the fact that its internals aren't in the same kind of self-immolation category as the BMPs is a big thumbs up. The BMP-3 comes in second, and I've got to say I like the BMP-3. That 100mm gun is super useful. There's definitely a solid vehicle in there that's really let down by the optics and the ergonomics. The vulnerability of it isn't that big a deal, not even given the BMP VBIED meme, because pretty much everything is super vulnerable in Black Sea. I guess you could even say that BMP 3s cut down on the amount of work you have to do as a player. When they detonate, you get a pretty clear cut loss, and you don't need to babysit an immobilized vehicle or a shattered infantry squad. Then we have the BMP 2M in third, which is probably broadly reflective of the food chain, and at the bottom of the pile, we've got a tie. Personally, I'd lean on the MTLB as being worse than the BMP-2. At least the BMP was designed from the ground up as an infantry fighting vehicle, while the MTLB is a kind of utility vehicle, and this particular variant just happens to have the 30mm cannon turret from a BTR stuck on top. And that said, it depends on the terrain a little bit. The MTLB has a lower ground pressure, so in certain circumstances it could be a better choice than the BMP. What I think is really interesting, though, is that of the five tracked IFVs in Black Sea, four of them are in use by the Russians. So from a logistics standpoint, they need to cater for four different infantry fighting vehicles. Thinking just in terms of ammunition, they all use the same kinds of 30mm cannon and coax ammo, which is good, but after that you've got the BMP-2, which needs 85 missiles, the BMP-2M needs 80-14s, and the BMP-3 needs AT-10s and 100mm air-bursting high-explosive shells. Then there are different engines, different road wheels, different tracks. All this stuff just piles up and complicates the supply so much. And that's without factoring in broader strategic issues like different units going at different speeds because they're equipped with different vehicles, different units needing different training, and you know, all that stuff. It really says something about the state of the Russian army, as modelled in combat mission, at least, that they're stuck with all this old Soviet war material that's a logistical nightmare. They are trying to upgrade elements of it, for example by bolting thermals and AT-14s onto BMP-2s, calling them BMP-2Ms and then trying to sell them on the export market. But part of the design philosophy of these old Soviet vehicles is that they're as small and compact as possible to try and present a small target. That means there's not really a lot of room inside the turret of something like a BMP, and trying to cram more systems or optics in doesn't necessarily make a better vehicle in practical terms. It might actually make it significantly less ergonomic and harder to operate effectively. The next poll is, 
what's your favorite line infantry squad in combat mission battle for normandy and we have the u.s rifle squad with thompson bayer scopes springfield bazooka and garens at the top of the pack with 45 percent of the vote the german grenadier squad with mp40 mg42 g43 panzerfaust and car 98ks relatively close at 38 percent and then the poor Commonwealth Infantry section and its Sten, Bren, Peart and the Enfields last at a measly 18%. This is probably not a bad representation of the combat mission food chain. I think the Americans are objectively the best out of those three, purely because of the M1 Garand. Having a semi-automatic as your basic rifleman's weapon translates into a lot of firepower especially when your squad has a lot of riflemen in it. These US squads also have the most troops in them overall. The other weapons are actually somewhat less impressive. The squad doesn't have a machine gun. It's got the BAR, but like the name implies, that's more of an automatic rifle than something you can actually lay down suppressive fire with. You're not going to get very far with a 20 round magazine. The scoped Springfield is nothing special, especially seen as though it's carried by a normal pixel truppen and not a marksman. The bazooka isn't the best AT weapon out there. It only fires a 60mm rocket, and while it can punch holes in German tanks, the post-penetration effect isn't always that great. My experience is that it usually takes a couple of hits to take out a Panzer IV, and something like a Panther is a tough target even when you get around the sides. As for the Germans, the MG42 is an absolute beast, but as came up in the comments, you've got a firepower distribution issue. Most of the squad's combat power is concentrated in the machine gunner, and if he goes down then you've got a problem. And he is a prime target, he makes more noise and muzzle flash than the rest of the squad, so he attracts more attention, and the TAC AI does seem to prioritise machine gunners if it sees them, for obvious reasons. Meanwhile, the Americans are getting their squad level firepower from Master Garands, and you'd have to kill a lot more riflemen to really bring their firepower down. So, although the MG42 is really good, I mean, you can't argue with 1200 rounds a minute, it has issues. The other weapons in the Grenadier squad aren't really anything exciting. The Car 98K is a pretty standard bolt action rifle with a 5 round magazine. And the G43 is a semi-automatic rifle, so it's a bit better, but you only tend to get one or two per squad. The Panzerfaust is very effective against enemy armor, but it's actually got to hit the enemy armor. There are a few different types of Panzerfaust, with improving warheads and ranges as time goes on, but fundamentally it's a one-shot weapon, and if the user misses, he's going to have a bad day. Finally we've got the commonwealth section i've done a unit guide on the commonwealth rifle company which goes over all this but the brits are more comparable to the germans than the americans again you have the reliance on a machine gun though the bren is less impressive than the mg42 and everybody else gets a bolt action rifle though the 10 round the enfield arguably edges out the car 98k What's interesting about the Commonwealth section is how middle ground it is. It doesn't really have a standout weapon like the Garand or the MG42. It's just kind of better than average across the board. That said, of the three AT weapons among these options, the Piat is probably the best, which is something I never thought I would say. It's got a bigger warhead than the bazooka, and you can use it more than once, unlike the Panzerfaust. Up at platoon level, we have a very different story, because you only get one Piat, whereas you should get at least two bazookas and a load of Panzerfausts. Definitely in the World War II combat mission games, I think two good enough weapons are better than one good weapon mostly because the scale of the conflict means you're going to get hammered you're going to take casualties and that makes quantity very important you might have noticed that i haven't talked about the thompson mp40 or the sten 
Firstly, there's another more specific poll focused on submachine guns, and secondly, the single SMG in the hands of the squad leader is not really that big a deal. He's not supposed to be using it. He's got a short-ranged automatic weapon because that stops him from engaging in the firefight. He's supposed to hang around and do squad leader things, not get stuck in with the lads. And then... The news of combat mission Cold War dropped, and obviously that called for a Cold War poll. What's everyone looking forward to the most? In hindsight, adding cluster munitions to the list in great big capitals, no less, probably skewed things a bit, because who doesn't want to see ICM, DPICM, and cluster bombs? Some screenshots are filtering out of them in action, and they look awesome. So, unsurprisingly, the option with the most explosions came out on top. How effective they will actually be is a different question. Aircraft are certainly going to have serious problems because we're dealing with peer-to-peer anti-aircraft capability. Along with the somewhat familiar Shilka and SA-13, the Americans actually have more AA than Stingers in this one. They've got the M163 VADS, which is basically a 20mm Vulcan Gatling gun bolted to an M113, and the Chaparral, which is a somewhat weird cut-down M113 with a quad mount for slightly modified Sidewinder missiles on the back. In quick battles especially, there's going to be some serious cost-benefit considerations about spending a lot on aircraft with cluster munitions, when they have to operate in such a high threat environment. ICM and DPICM, for straight high explosive and dual purpose improved conventional munitions respectively, are a little different because they're fired by artillery, which doesn't have a counter threat modelled in the same way as close air support. The tricky part I think will lie in the mobility of both sides. Everyone in Cold War is going to be mechanised, everyone is going to be moving around at high speeds, so actually catching the enemy in a barrage could be more difficult than it sounds. Aircraft at least have the advantage that they are basically aiming in real time at specific targets, whereas with the artillery you're going to need to get your timing right and give a moving enemy the correct lead for good effect. And that doesn't stop artillery delivered cluster munitions being generally awesome, and while mobility is an issue, there are also going to be circumstances where either or both sides are tied to static positions where cluster munitions are going to be extremely effective. Back to the poll, the Soviets lead the rest of the pack with the US a little way behind. I'm honestly pretty stoked to play both. On the one hand, you have the Soviets at their peak and a chance to see all their Cold War era kit when it was cutting edge, not the way we see it in Shock Force and Black Sea when it's been languishing behind NATO for 20 years. Then there's the operational side of things. The Soviets have combined arms and recon pull literally built into their forces with formations like forward security detachments. And it's going to be really interesting taking them out for a spin and seeing how they work. On the other hand, we have the Americans, who I'd expect to be more familiar with, but I'm actually not. I know a lot more about the Soviets in this kind of 79 to 82 period covered by the game. I might have a pretty good handle on the Abrams and the Bradley, but even these are going to be very early versions, and the bulk of the US forces are going to be M60s and M113s, which are, should we say, a little different. Comparisons to Sherman's and M3 half-tracks respectively are probably not too far out of the ballpark. Certainly their last generation vehicles compared to the Abrams and the Bradley, which is probably going to lead to some interesting fights after getting so used to American technical superiority in the more modern games. Finally, lagging behind everyone else, at a paltry 8%, we have sadistic NTC scenarios. That's what I would have voted for. I am really looking forward to the National Training Center and the campaign that comes with it. For those who don't know, the NTC is a chunk of the Mojave Desert where US Army units go to learn to fight in realistic conditions. The enemy there is known as the Opposing Force, or Op4, and they not only fight using Soviet doctrine and tactics, but they get all kinds of unfair advantages to give the units in the training rotation the hardest time possible. It's a serious challenge that really puts training units through the ringer to prepare them for actual combat. Almost everyone comes away having gotten a good kicking, but also having gained a lot of important lessons. 
one interesting offshoot of the NTC element of the game is that there are two terrain sets, Western Europe Green and Lush, and Mojave Desert Brown and Arid. So not only are hypothetical Middle Eastern encounters on the table, but you can apparently switch an option in the editor and change the terrain sets on the fly. A few screenshots are filtered out of the same scenes, but with the terrain sets switched, which also switches the camouflage options. And this could lead to some really interesting tactical exploration around the impact of terrain. It's entirely plausible to play a scenario in one terrain set and then replay it in the other, and then you can compare and contrast. Rounding out this batch of polls, we've got the unit choice question. You're going off to man an isolated combat outpost with a US infantry platoon in Shock Force 2, and you have space for one specialist team. Whatever you bring will come with enough ammunition, and what you're going to be doing is conducted dismounted patrols against lightly armed insurgents. And the choices were sniper team, breach team, 60mm mortar team, javelin team, or breach team. Because I apparently forgot what I was doing when I was making the poll. I actually meant to put a Mark 19 in the final slot, the automatic grenade launcher, but that ship has sailed really, hasn't it? I can tell you without any spoilers that the missions I'm up to in Valleys of Death would be so much easier if I had a mortar. The ability to conduct indirect fire on your own to do it organically is just spectacularly useful in all manner of situations and not having to rely on off-map heavy artillery support is a must because you might not get it. In second place is the sniper team at 28%. I'm not sure what they actually bring to the party that a platoon of infantrymen and two general purpose machine guns doesn't, especially at the kinds of infantry engagement ranges that you get in combat mission. My opinion is that snipers are generally pretty overhyped, especially when the one thing they really add is precision target engagement, which we could do much more effectively with the light mortar by just throwing as much ammunition at the enemy as possible, or using our next choice, the javelin. I'd make the javelin a close second to the mortar, mostly for the reasons that people left in the comments. Thermals are a big deal so it has significant utility before you even engage the enemy. When you do, it gives you the ability to put a missile pretty much anywhere you like within two and a half kilometers, providing you have line of sight. Granted, it's not being used in its intended role as an anti-tank weapon, but that 125mm warhead is not something you want to suddenly be sharing your firing position with. And that said, from a practical perspective, I'm not sure that the player's concept of enough ammunition is going to be the same as the people who are paying 80 grand for each missile, especially when you're blapping goat herders on some mountainside somewhere. Finally, we've got the breach team. It's a little different to the others in that you're not really gaining a specific weapon system. You're gaining an ability in combat mission terms to blast through walls, whether that's to create new routes or to violently assault buildings. So it's more of a basic utility choice. Of course, it depends a lot on the terrain and where you're going to be patrolling. If it's compound country or an urban area, then yeah, definitely a priority, especially if the general line of sight is short and the other weapon options in the pole aren't going to pay out as well. On the flip side, if you're out in the middle of nowhere with big open sight lines, it's less of a big deal. So that is a quick roundup of the first four polls. I am just randomly inventing these every Monday, so it's a bit of a weird mix. Uh, I should probably have some kind of plan, but I'm sure it'll become more focused when Cold War or Fire and Rubble drop, which at least one of them should be doing quite soon. Hope you all enjoyed this slightly different content, and I will see you in the next video.